Wangara Coast, near Bundaberg, southern Queensland, is a 30-kilometre stretch of rocky shoreline, supporting an astounding diversity of marine life. This coast is strewn with basalt boulders, cut deep by rocky crevices and dotted with low rocky headlands. Rock pools of all shapes and sizes provide diverse intertidal habitats. Just offshore, rocky shelves and boulders support fringing coral reef, diverse fish life and invertebrates of all descriptions. Endangered sea turtles, dugong, dolphins, even humpback whales are often seen along this coast. Outdoor recreation, agriculture and tourism industries thrive here and attract visitors to the region. A pleasant climate, coastal activities like diving, fishing and boating have drawn new residents to a sea change lifestyle. However, unprecedented population growth and increasing coastal development pose considerable challenges for managing this unique and vulnerable coastal environment. Wangara's distinctive rocky coastline derives from the hummock, a prominent hill amongst the flat sugarcane fields of Bundaberg. This extinct shield volcano last erupted one million years ago, depositing a volcanic rock layer on a portion of the ancient Burnett River floodplain. Local geologist Professor Alex Grady believes this coast has some unique qualities that contribute to the diversity of marine life found here. As a geologist, I've worked in a whole variety of places, both around Australia and New Zealand and in Indonesia. And one of the characteristics of this shoreline is that you don't see many very high cliffs. You see bluffs. You see broad, low, uh, rocky foreshores with uh, beautiful tidal pools in them at uh, low tide um, and a very rubbly um, appearance of the... Uh, foreshore uh, where the basalt occurs. One of the things that is very characteristic of this terrain here, particularly the coastal rocky zones but also inland, is the, the fact that when you see the basalts mostly what you see is rounded boulders and many people think that because the basalt is a volcanic rock and you see these rounded boulders that the boulders were actually thrown out of the old volcano. That's incorrect. The basalt volcanoes don't spew out boulders. Uh, what they do is spew out liquid lava. These boulders are formed by the weathering and of the basalt. Another feature that you can see in some places along this coastline is layering in the uh, actual basalt. Um, these basalts were erupted full of gas and the gas was frothing out as the basalt flowed, and as the basalt cooled, the gas cavities, the gas bubbles, were frozen in some parts of the basalt. And we end up with what is called a vesicular basalt, a very bubbly or holy basalt. Um, and in some places, the basalt was flowing so strongly that the bubble-rich and the bubble-poor areas of the basalt form different layers. They form, however, tremendous um, zones of protection for the wildlife that live in the intertidal zone. And in this region you get tremendous diversity of the marine life that's characteristic of the intertidal zone. From the hummock, a shield-shaped crust of basalt can be found along the coast. This basalt layer sits over much older sandstone, siltstone and shale. Beachcombers here will also discover fossil beach rock. This recent formation is consolidated beach, carbonate sand, shell fragments and quartz. This provides another substrate for Wangara's fringing reef life. The Wangara coast is located south of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park near Bundaberg's small crops, sugarcane and rum industries. Wangara's rocky shoreline is between the Burnett and Elliott rivers and helps form the western coast of a large shallow bay known as Harvey Bay. The region is within Queensland's Great Sandy Marine Park. Wangara has a pleasant climate influenced by subtropical and temperate ocean currents. 
The tiny 1.5 kilometre stretch of beach at Mon Repo is one of Australia's most important and famous nesting sites for endangered sea turtles. With pool names like Pandora's Box, The Levels, Coral Wonderland, Hammerhead Bend and The Paint Box, it's easy to appreciate that to know a tide pool is to love it. Wangari Coast scientists and volunteers study marine life in local pools by observing individual pools and recording data over time. Each pool offers different microhabitats, influenced by size, depth, temperature and water movement, as well as shelves, cracks or rocks for hiding or attaching. Scientists record greater species diversity from lower splash zone pools that are only exposed at low tide compared with pools higher on the shore that can remain dry during small tidal changes. Animals and plants must survive many challenges across these rugged intertidal zones, including tidal surge and rough sea conditions. Sessile organisms, like oysters, stay permanently attached to the rocks. Others, like fish, are free to move around for food or shelter. Shells, camouflage, location and speed are a few examples of survival adaptations used by tide pool organisms. The keen tide pool explorer is likely to find hermit crabs all along rocky coasts. These small crustaceans are found scavenging along algae covered rocks, moving around in pools or sheltering under rocks and shelves. They're called hermit crabs because they carry their protective shells with them and often curl up to hide deep in their shell. Hermit crabs inhabit a variety of shell types from marine snails. As hermit crabs grow, they must compete for larger shells. So in a healthy hermit crab area, you'll find very few empty shells. Like hermit crabs, fiddler and swimmer crabs are always busy collecting leftover food particles from algae covered rocks and crevices. These crabs have strong shells that are colourful or camouflaged. They use modified appendages for walking, swimming, feeding, seeing, reproduction and defence. Coastal birds such as herons, gulls and kites are often seen hunting for crabs in tidal pools. Therefore, sudden movement or shadows overhead will send most crabs scuttling for a hiding place. Barnacles are found in the mid to lower splash zone pools and are related to crabs. These animals secrete a distinct outer covering, often shaped like a tiny volcano, and are cemented by their head to the rocks. Barnacles wave special feeding appendages in the water to catch microscopic prey organisms, known as plankton. Tube worms are colourful relatives of earthworms and secrete a tube into a crevice for protection. Their bushy feeding appendages resemble tiny feather dusters or Christmas trees. They're always found in submerged low pools and can retract quickly into their own tube if disturbed. Feather stars and sea stars have at least five and sometimes dozens of arms attached to their central body. These animals can move around the tide pools and eat algae, coral and particles. They're usually found in deeper splash zone pools or in wet protected areas of higher pools. These animals have a variety of colours, textures and sizes and may also have camouflage colours to blend in with their habitat. Sea cucumbers found in the Wangara Coast tidal pools are long, black, tubular-shaped animals that are slow-moving. They are found in silty or sandy patches and crevices of the mid to low pools, always covered with water. They are the vacuum cleaners of the sea because they filter sand for leftover material that contains nutrients. Marine snails are soft-bodied animals that make their own protective shells. Grazing snails, like periwinkles, eat algae, while carnivorous snails, like whelks, eat other snails. Both types are found throughout the intertidal area. Different shapes and sizes of marine snails help scientists to classify them. After a marine snail dies, hermit crabs use leftover shells for portable protection, and scientists study shells to learn more about their local snail populations. Nudibranchs are marine snails without shells 
and are also known as sea slugs. They feed on coral and algae and can be very colourful or camouflaged. Sea hares are camouflaged nudibranchs that can grow up to 20 centimetres long. Coral, anemones, zoanthids and hydroids are all related because they all have special stinging cells for capturing food. They often live in colonies submerged in deeper pools. Wangari's tidal pools feature mostly soft coral. Sponges are very simple marine animals that filter feed and display a variety of forms, textures and colours. They require a moist or submerged location. Green, brown and red algae flourish in rocky foreshore habitat. Algae shapes vary from long strands to rounded leaves and delicate branching structures. Some algae make their own bubble-like sacs to remain upright in a pool. Cropped turf-like algae is a favourite food of grazing snails. All algae is a fundamental part of marine ecosystem food webs. Algal blooms occur naturally depending on sea and weather conditions. However, excessive growth of algae may indicate impact from shore activities. At more than 1,000 different species, fish diversity near the Wangara coast rivals that of the Great Barrier Reef. The East Australian current brings cool southern waters and temperate fish up the Queensland coast. Fringing coral reef amongst the rock shelves and bommies is ideal habitat for small species and juveniles. Cryptic fish are coloured to blend into the rocky environment and many interesting damsels, blennies and gobies are found in the tidal pools. Many birds hunt in the intertidal regions and the white-faced reef heron uses stealth and camouflage to ambush tide pool creatures. Osprey cruise along the coastline, swooping to grab fish with their powerful talons. Cormorants have webbed feet to chase bait fish through the water. Gulls dive on small schooling fish or hunt and scavenge in the tide pools. Here are some animals to be careful of in tide pools. The Wangara Coast Monitoring and Education Project Group studies coastal ecology and collects data about water quality, coral reefs and intertidal habitats in the region. The group provides opportunities for volunteers to help with field work, gather new skills and learn more about the marine environment. School groups, scientists and coastal managers also work with the group to raise awareness about the Wangara Coast. Local zoologist Liz Tanner teaches in the Science Department at Central Queensland University Bundaberg and is a project officer with the Wangara Coast Monitoring and Education Project. Liz was part of the original team which established the project in 1997. We were very interested in marine biodiversity here. Um, there's so many species just so close to shore. You can literally step right off the coast, right off a rock shelf and onto coral reef. So we were concerned a little bit about how other development, things that are happening around the coast, um, human activities might impact something so close, habitat so close to shore. Information about the marine park area at the time was focused on marine turtles and really their habitat that was required for the nesting beach at Monroe Pau and also their internesting habitat which is just the offshore regions, uh, the offshore waters I suppose, just uh, adjacent to the, to the beach. The rocky shore habitats, the intertidal zones, uh, the biodiversity in those were not really studied. So we recognized that there was a lack of information about uh, the biodiversity, the animals, other marine life besides sea turtles here. 
So our group applied for Coast Care funding to try to set up some field studies. Our community here uses uh, the coastal resources in so many ways. Uh, we really wanted to take a multi-user approach to contributing to management planning and management decisions that would be made about this coast. Now a decade on, we've learned so much about the marine life here and we've collected a lot of resources uh, to contribute to the community. We've also been lucky enough to work with hundreds of volunteers who volunteer with us in our field activities for all sorts of reasons. We do water quality monitoring, we also look at um, fringing coral reef monitoring, but it seems to be the tide pool monitoring is the thing that draws the most different types of volunteers. They come from all walks of life, all different types of age groups come down to the tide pools to join us, and uh, their enthusiasm really inspires us. Kathy Gatley, ranger in charge at Monropo Conservation Park, reveals not only her enthusiasm for the endangered loggerhead turtle that nests along Monropo, but also her passion for the Wangara coastline. Uh, I'm the ranger in charge with the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. I'm based here at Monropo Conservation Park. My job is to look after this park, a little park in the mouth of the Burnett River, which is Baruba Island, and also the Wangara Coast, which is part of the Great Sandy Marine Park. We do a lot of work with uh, schools. Education is a big, big part of um, helping people to understand about the natural environment, both turtles, the coastal environment in general. Um, so that's one of our main roles here is to, to teach people about these things so that, that they can be there for another day. Um, the more education we can get down, you know, even if it's to grade one children, they take that home and it spreads throughout the community. So it's a great thing to do. Uh, we do work with uh, kids out of season as well on the beach, um, talking about turtles, talking about the marine park, um, looking at different areas within the mangroves and what life supports are in there as well. Sherry O'Brien is a project officer with the Wangara Coast Monitoring and Education Project. Sherry is interested in aquatic resource management and leads the group's water quality monitoring team. Volunteers collect samples and record data about coastal estuarine and tide pool water quality. This data helps managers better understand coastal processes. So we put the probe in the water and make sure that it's fully submerged. Yeah. Now this is our TPS probe. This is a data logging probe. We um, put the probe in, it runs all the information into this little box. Volunteers and visitors to the tidal pools enjoy the experience of discovering new marine life and enhancing their knowledge and understanding of more familiar creatures. Um, it would have to be hermit crabs, that would have to be the sponge. Uh, fish, it's rather interesting watching its, their erratic behaviour. Um, I like the soft coral because it feels like jelly. I think I like all the soft and squishy things. <laughs> I don't know, I think a lot of things are special here. Coastal managers work with researchers, communities, local government and industry to develop best practice guidelines for sustainable use. Natural processes such as climate, weather and nearby rivers influence intertidal and fringing reef habitats. This year's been kind of bad for coral because there's been coral bleaching happening and it's affected a whole heap of coral in the tide pools. What coral bleaching does is makes the coral go like um, fluoro coloured. It's doing it because of the climate we think this year. Human activity adjacent to marine areas may also impact on coastal ecology. People of all ages can help look after the rocky shore habitat. 
here along our Woongara coastline we have um, such a, a special resource right off our coastline which has got a lot of development. We've got a, a township sort of more or less all along our coastline. It's getting more and more popular as people move into the area. So um, it's got special management concerns rather than uh, reefs that may be way out in the ocean and, and not so easy to impact on. Also we've got with the um, residential and uh, commercial areas, you've got uh, runoff as well into the ocean, so we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing there. Um, and also we've got a big agricultural industry as well. Um, so all of these things impact on the marine park. If um, I wanted to pick up one of these animals in the tide pool, how's the best way to have a look at it? Just put your hand under the water, pick up this very carefully, when you bring it back, just try to remember where it was. With our rock pools, if you do turn over a rock to see if there's a crab hiding underneath or to discover something, put that back so you're keeping that home environment for the sea creatures still there. Important not to collect things, uh, like shells are very important. You might think it's a lovely shell to take home, but that could be the, you know, the next home for a hermit crab. There are things you can do to help preserve tidal pool environments. To start with, you can talk to a ranger. Leave shells and rocks where you find them. Be careful what you touch. Always handle the animals carefully and always take your rubbish with you. We can all play our part in protecting our coastal environment. The future is in our hands. <laughs>